Good morning, good afternoon. It's a lot of animals in this room right now. It's pretty crazy. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Digital Life Project. And uh, as you can see, this is about the scanning, animation, and sharing of animals, living animals specifically. Um, so myself, I am a werewolf. I used to be a werewolf. I was at one point in time. Um, my name is Jeremy Bott. A lot of people, my friends call me Jer. Um, so I've been using computers for a while, I'm sure like a lot of us. Uh, initially it was to uh, play video games, bug my dad and said, hey, you know, I, I, need, I, need, I need a computer, I, gotta, I need it for school, I need to learn all this stuff. The reality is I wanted to play games. But, you know, the joke was on me because in order to get those games to work on the 486, I had to spend a lot of time tweaking. And then in that, I fell in love with the technology, fell in love with the logistics and the, the power of it. Eventually started playing around with some animation tools. This uh, newspaper clipping is uh, from a while ago. Um, a high school radio station, I was responsible for moving us from the old reel-to-reel to, -reel to a uh, digital uh, editing workstation and audio. Um, wrong button. So, I guess this really starts, I mean, I, I like to think of fundamentals, and the fundamentals for me is uh, starting with my, my mother, who was a respiratory therapist, rather studying to be a respiratory therapist. She had to stop because she had to take care of my sister and I. And uh, she had these textbooks, medical textbooks, all over the place. And since she wasn't in school, I don't think she cared too much if her kids were rifling through these expensive textbooks. And that's where I fell in love with anatomy and physiology. I couldn't read any of the Latin, so that was kind of a benefit to me. But then uh, growing up, I... Uh, I realized I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, the, the concept of helping people, but then understanding these biomechanics and seeing the infinite in that was, was fascinating to me. Um, but then, you know, she told me, she's like, well, you know, just so you know, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of expensive, and then also, there's gonna be a lot of school. And for me, that terrified me. It was like going to jail. So instead of that, I became a Microsoft certified systems engineer, which later became the solutions expert, which I think is definitely more accurate, because it was basically a product specialist. And uh, you know, that meant I had to kind of keep recertifying every time a new product came out, so eventually I just let it go. Um, so then, rebooted my life, studied animation, basically gave away everything away that I had, and uh, Got a job in Vancouver, BC. I work on uh, some animated feature films. I worked on many animated TV series. I worked on some monster movies. I worked on a video game. And after working on the video game, I was like, you know, there's gotta be something more than just entertainment for, for animation. Because it's such a powerful tool. It's one of the most powerful communication tools I've ever seen. I remember the first time I saw, it was like a BBC special on the human body and they're kind of traveling through ear canals and stuff like that. And, and that one image was, more powerful than all these textbooks I had seen over the years. And I was like, gosh, like the, the things you can communicate through this is incredible. So I, I eventually got into uh, uh, some, some medical documentary work, specifically on the lungs and blood and the eyes. So then that's kind of one branch. And then there's another branch that's been around a lot longer than I've been around. Matter of fact, it's been around for 30,000 years, at least, at least. These are the uh, Chavo Caves, if I'm pronouncing that right, in southern France. And they discovered these in, I believe, 1994. And it's, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. I don't know. I, when I picture like 30,000 years ago, I don't picture cave paintings like this. I mean, these are absolutely gorgeous. And then, then there's these funky drawings, another example of trying to record life. And it's funny because I'd never seen this before. I didn't know that this, this scientist did this. Um, but he's recording the, the, the movements of plants. He developed a really interesting mechanism for doing this. And it's funny because it's, it's Charles Darwin. And, and of course, what he learned was that these plants were greatly affected by their environment. So you know, we can't separate the model from the environment. It's a very difficult thing, we, just like we can't separate the model from its behavior. So in essence, a 3D model, unless it's moving, it's kind of taking away from what that really is. And of course, I think a lot of us recognize this. If you take these sequences of images that were shot, eventually you have motion. Pretty much, I think, the first accurate recording of a movement of an animal. And then, 1957, we have the first digitally recorded animal, Walden. Good old Walden had a dad who was a 
uh, developer, he, he created this drum scanner. So he took a photo of Walden and fed it to the scanner and he got this whopping resolution of 176 by 176 pixels. Let's go to 2017. This is kind of where my story comes into this branch. And in 2017, I saw this online. And I was able to spin and tumble this in my, my, my web browser. You know, this open source portal to information and I can see it in 3D better than I can see it in my 3D application that cost a couple thousand dollars. I was like, what, what is, what's going on here? So I contacted Duncan Urshik at the Digital Life Project at University of Massachusetts and I was like, how can I help? And he's like, well, we'd love to have you. So that's kind of where I come into this. So now we're gonna be digitizing all this stuff, right? Why? It's a really big question. I mean, why? I mean, you know, entertainment was easy. It was like, well, we're entertained by it. What's the, what's the deeper meaning in it? It's like, oh, you can stick stuff in there. But now we're digitizing animals. We're getting serious about stuff. Well, it's easy to have a mission. And that was the thing that Duncan ultimately said. He's like, well, Jeremy, here's, here's our mission. Number one, open access science. Open access meaning that it's not behind a paywall. It's not in some bookshelf somewhere that you have to like, get a library card, a special university to access. Like, you can actually, like, just, it's yours. Like, it's digital as well, so it's easy access. Number two, hands-on, immersive education. Meaning that, you know, I can look at those books, and as I was sharing before, you know, as I'm looking through these books, it's like giving me all this information, but there's nothing like seeing it move. So then take it one step further. What if I was able to, like, take those lungs and then move them around and, and, and dive through them, which is what I got to do eventually. And it was mind-blowing what that does. And the last piece is something that I'm still having this, this challenge of really discussing because it's like, well, how does this conservation come in? This is not conservation like we're trying to build a matrix, like let the animals die and we'll scan them all. We just live in this virtual reality because you know, that's one part of it. But conservation in terms of making us aware of what's out there, making us aware of what a rhino really is, making us aware of the different species of rhino. Oh, there's 20,000 of these left. There's only le you know, 60 of these and there's maybe 80 of these left. Sumatran rhinos. And, and we start to empathize. We see it enough, especially if it contains its story, it contains its scars, it contains all this stuff, it's, it's, we empathize with it. So when there's a call to action, we're losing a friend, potentially, in danger. So we share them, we get them out there, digitize them, put them out there, make them free, make it non-commercial so that we, someone doesn't take that shark and immediately make another Jaws movie where it's just tearing people apart, but they, they, they use it for a non-commercial purpose. And what we discovered is people are using this stuff in ways that are communicating very powerful messages. How do we do it? Process, we're gonna get a little bit technical here. So process is kind of funny because when you're dealing with reality, there's infinite variables, so <laughs> yeah, process. Number one, you plan. So that's usually through a relationship. A uh, relationship with a local biologist that's in the area to where these, these species exist, having uh, you know, a relationship with them, and then setting up a time to visit, and then when we visit, we set up cameras. This is Duncan basically setting up cameras in an, uh, a polar bear uh, enclosure, and then also setting up cameras for the rhino at the Perth Zoo in Australia. Next step is record. Record, Duncan's taken pictures manually on the ground, but you can see that there's uh, cameras set up around him, so the cameras around him up in the air for the for photogrammetry scanning. Man, a word. Um, and then on the right we have a shark that's being scanned. And that shark was brought aboard, the pump was put into its mouth, seawater is flushed through its gills, it's, it's on the boat for about a minute, and then it's put back into the ocean. And the other way we scan is in the lab. Usually smaller animals, you can see that there is the beast cam uh, starting on left, and that one's handheld, but of course when it's handheld, you end up with blurrier photos, you don't end up with much detail. Then we have the uh, beast cam as it stands, the more uh, tried and true one in the center. And that one was used to capture the tokay gecko that you saw earlier. And then on the right, you have uh, a, a way of kind of dealing with the problem with lighting, because if you have shadow, that shadow will bake into the final model. So reconstruction. Um, so if anyone's done any kind of 3D modeling, I think they've seen something like this. You grab image planes, you line up the image planes, and you just kind of model. And it works well for cars and stuff, but when you start modeling organic creatures, they end up kind of looking boxy. And plus, you're dealing with distortion. When looking at anything from one perspective, it's easy to distort that view. So then, how do we handle this illusion, this distortion? More cameras, more angles, more perspectives. And how many people are familiar with photogrammetry? 
All right, I'll see you later. <laughs> All right, then I'll make this quick. Where's the eye? Where's the right front? Where's the right back? Okay, so we know where that point is. Boom, we have a 3D model. It looks great. Well, first you have to mesh it, then you can project that texture, but you already know that. It doesn't always turn out that well the first time. Sometimes we have to tweak the lens that's coming in. We have to, the information from the camera. Sometimes we have to tweak the colors themselves. Sometimes you know, the environment's constantly changing, so we have to set the, the cameras to automatically regulate the color. We tweak those and we get something a little bit better. It's like, yes, this is totally gonna work. I'm just gonna mesh it now. And then you try over and over and over and over. And if you've ever done photogrammetry processing, especially you know, with uh, more flexible software, um, it's, uh, it's very time consuming and very painful. So eventually we do get a model that looks like, okay, this is gonna work. This is, this is something that's worth meshing. And it works pretty good, but of course, you're gonna have areas that are occluded. And those areas you have to somehow clean up. Fortunately, there are other people out there that are believers in sharing information. For example, this rhino head you can go and grab from Sketchfab, and you can see the skull and how far away it is from the mouth, and you can see how articulate that mouth is, kind of like a horse, right? It's like you literally shake hands with that mouth. That's another story, by the way. Then you have turtles, so this is another issue. So you have something that's very flat, it's laying on the ground, and this whole backside is going to be occluded, or the whole top side, so then you take two scans. Don't worry, it was quite comfortable. There was a little bed of towel set up, and then we literally take one shot. We do everything in our power to make sure, like, well, if it doesn't work this time, we have another animal. So we take the shot, and we make sure it's comfortable and put it back. This is Scallywag, by the way, and it was released in February back in the ocean after it was uh, at the sanctuary for a couple months. So a big part of this, too, is to maintain the accuracy as well as find tools to stitch this back together. So actually, this is a different turtle. This is a big flatback sea turtle. It's about 300 pounds. And uh, how do I put this together? Because, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'll just grab these points and move them together. But then I'm distorting the information, right? This is for science. This needs to be accurate. This is not... Um, purely just to get it done. So I actually rig it. So this is where a process kind of starts to break down. We think like, first your model, then you texture, then you rig, then you animate. Da -da -da. But actually, I'm, before I even have like a finished model to animate, I'm already rigging, and then I'm animating it. Flip that turtle up down, you know, make sure the pivot points are correct, pose in position, have a full model. Retopologize on top of that, and maintained all its proportions. So when a scientist looks at it, and the best part is too, of course, is if you have one rig and another rig, and then you pose it, all the points line up, you have a true. So then you have a third rig, which you know is accurate. But you still have occluded areas. You still have areas, you have gaps in the data. So how do you handle this? Well, you contact the zoologist, the biologist in the local area, and you're like, yeah, I'm missing these parts. And they're like, okay, no problem. And they send you photos. Do you know what that is? Does anyone know what that is? Uh, what, what part of an elephant? So it's actually a rhino. It's a, the neck and chest of a rhino. The top part is underneath here. So next we have to verify. And this is another piece. So the, you know, the big thing with dealing with these animals is that you know, getting, getting those proportions right, and that's part of like rigging it a couple times. And then the next is the model. So it's important to verify the data because we can kind of, it's easy to kind of just go off on this tangent and like, oh, it looks great, it looks great. But yeah, but if it, did you line it up? Did you, did you see how much, how, how well it lined up? Is it true? Do we, do we maintain the story of this animal? Do we maintain the, do we maintain the top, the texture, so we have the suntan spots, the parts where it got caught in a barbed wire or whatever? But you know, what about the shape? You know, does, does it maintain its story? It's another way. So this is what Blender 2.8 was able to give me. Uh, and then, you know, it upped the game a little bit. Rig, and here we are, we're kind of out of order now already, right? So, so now I'm rigging, but this is the rig rig, the real rig, the legit rig. So here's a turtle, it's rigged, and you guys all know, if you know photogrammetry, then you know how rigging works. So we have uh, the big red. The big red is pretty much the influence of the shell. We have the uh, sling-tailed agama. Lizard, it's about that big. And we animate. So animation, we gotta call the experts in for this one. We gotta call the professional actors. <laughs> so we have animal mocap. This is uh, Savas in Cyprus. He's doing some amazing stuff over there. It's a pleasure working with him. And then we can give it to the machines and let them do their guesswork and you know, maybe they'll eventually hit it right. Or we can do it the old fashioned way. 
It's, it's funny to call this old-fashioned. But uh, manually, so we, we, we have video reference of the animal, we animate it, then we work with the zoologist, biologist to, to make sure that we're savvy. And a lot of it has to do with timing, of course, or the timing and weight, timing and weight. And of course, if your, your anatomy is correct, then it makes the other stuff much easier. And I, you know, I, I do want to make one kind of backup point, which is like a lot of these processes of rigging it over and over again, if you talk to most artists that work in the industry, they'll say like, you're crazy, why would you want to rig it? It's like, I put the pivots in there and I hit a button that says skin. There's no options, no settings. I just hit skin and it's skinned. So why not, right? Last piece is share. So right now, I don't have any animations for you in this presentation, but you can right now, on your laptop or your phone, you can go and see 50 plus animals at these super high resolutions, and you can download them if you want. You can pop them into Blender and you can make your own interpretations of what you see in this. The other part of sharing, pretty critical piece in this, is the software. And having used commercial software, having spent tens of thousands of dollars on software myself, it's a, it's a terrifying thing. New version comes out, am I compatible? Hey, I want to work with you, I want to work with you. How did you do that? Can we work together? Ah, but I'm using version 17, I'm using 2011. It's like, tika. Open source software, not a problem. It's like, I can pull out a USB stick and give you all my project files, especially when you have open source animals, and the software and everything you need, even your operating system, your entire operating system is free and accessible. And you can give it to other people without having to have a second guess on it. Like, what that does for freedom of speech is unreal. Every time, like, just like, you know, you put these presentations together, it's like, okay, I'm gonna use this image. Oh crap, who made that? How do they, do I, I should, how do I get in touch with them? How do I do this? How do I, you know, it's like, it's, it's so burying. But when you start to like bury yourself in open source, open concepts, creative commons, it frees you to say what you need to say without having to worry about somebody suing you for something that, am I really taking away your money? Am I really hurting you? So these softwares, particularly I want to point out Wire, Wire.com. If any of you are sick of Skype, it's an open source piece of software. It's encrypted, it's stable, it runs on any platform. It'll run on your phone via installed app. It'll run via a browser if you want. Screen sharing, 30 frames a second. I'll like load up a video on YouTube and stream the video that I'm watching from my desktop with my peers that are in Germany or at University of Massachusetts. And of course, I think you recognize a lot of these other pieces, so I'm just gonna kind of shift over to the Blender add-ons, particularly when it comes to photogrammetry. But first and foremost for me is interface. Like how we interface with this stuff is for me is important. It's like, I don't wanna click on another list this linear thinking stuff doesn't work for me. I want to gesture like a wizard. If I'm in 3D, you know, I remember being a kid and like, you know, like make something and pull this and bash that and move this together. Like, I think gesture, ge Iron Man, exactly. Like, you know, this is what I want. And, and radio menus is huge. And the ability to customize radio menus is, for me, it's priceless. It takes away the thinking. It becomes literally muscle memory. So then we have a point cloud visualizer, which, if anyone's interested, come grab me. I'll sit down with my laptop. I'll show you what this thing does. It's absolutely incredible. You can, you know, the fact that it runs on my little laptop that doesn't have an AMD or an NVIDIA card is incredible to me as well. Then we have the, uh, the last one, the add-on photogrammetry importer, which uh, basically that's how I'm able to get my cameras into Blender. That's how I'm able to do all that double checking work. And I think it was made by a student. I contacted him, hey, you're gonna be a BlendCon. He's like, oh, I got class. It's like, this is, this is mind blowing. So the future of the project, where are we going here? Well, we're gonna keep on making animals, for one. But then there's, there's these certain areas that we wanna pay more attention to. Because we get kinda, you know, it, it's, it's, when, you're, when you're dealing with the accuracy of maintaining the model, other things start to slip, and we wanna figure out ways where we can do this. But when it comes to a color checker, it's a little bit tricky. Because the animal's not gonna stand next to the color checker while you take your shots. We have to figure out ways to do that. We have to figure out accurate ways of capturing translucency or subsurface scattering. And then, of course, procedural textures, which is a whole other level. Like, we're looking at this animal, now when we move into the surface, how are we gonna capture the cells, the wrinkles, the scales? It's like a lot of that stuff, I mean, you're talking Fibonacci and filiotaxis patterns all over the place. So you go, if you go crazy with that rubber stamp, it's like, yeah, the model looks great from here, but the moment you get here, eh, you're, you're ruining the truth of it. So, you know, it's like I look at the Agama lizard, it's like the, these spirals that just like come out of the center, it's the most gorgeous thing. And you have to like keep that story, it's important.
Because through an animal, we can see ourselves a little bit in a way that, you know, I don't know, we're not aware of when we see in the mirror. Another one is putting them in their environment, capturing the environment and putting them back to where they were. So we can see them because, again, without their movement, without their environment, what are they? I mean, a lot of times you can see the environment. You can almost picture how this animal would behave in its environment, how it would need to behave to survive in its environment. Last piece for now is fur. Fur is in particularly important at this moment because everyone wants to put it on everything. But the other reason is because the next animal that I'm going to be working on is a polar bear. And this thing is gorgeous. It makes my heart melt. Love it. So this gets me thinking about these, these concepts of open source, open ideas, and, and, and it's like, how would this project really truly exist in a way that, 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 that feels real if we didn't have open source? And my belief, it wouldn't. I went through a lot of times in the industry where I was like, how can I keep doing this? Like, what, what is, what, what, what? What can I carry on? I'm, 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 a, I'm a Microsoft certified systems engineer again. I'm a product specialist again. So what happens when they fold or someone buys them out and shuts them down? I'm like, this information is lost. It's trapped behind a, a pay gate again. How can I share it? How, how, do, how does this open science, how do these open ideas, how does this open exploration exist if you need a minimum $2,000 ticket to entry per year? And the other part of it is, it's like I often forget. It's like, well, well, it's gone, it's gone. And my eyes foveate and tighten and my head hurts. And then I realize, well, I have something pretty amazing in this. We all do. We have something that ultimately every one of us really has. I can say that. Because a computer, I can say everyone's, well, no, everyone's got a computer. So what is that best reference? What is that thing when I look at an animal that I can kind of test some ideas out to have a better understanding of its articulation? It's an important piece. just want to stick it in there. I think it's easy to forget as I walk. I work in a studio half of my time, and I work uh, with the Digital Light Project my other half of the time and some other little bits on the other side. But it's like when I walk through rows of animators who are plugged in and they're making life like this, where's the reference? Oh, it's just on the second monitor, right? They just, they just it's like when you have this. Easy thing to forget. So that's all I have to say about this, besides a big thank you to Blender, the Blender community, to anyone that has any kind of contribution in an open source project. Even if you find a bug and you take the five minutes, I'm sorry, two minutes and 35 seconds to do a quick note of that bug, maybe plop it somewhere else, say, hey, everyone, I found a bug. Even small things like that are huge. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of Duncan, Johnson, and Robert. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach me direct through verbal007.com. Uh, there's a little form. You can just... um, or Twitter. And of course, go to the Sketchfab page, check out the animals, have fun, play with them, and let us know what you learn. And if you make something cool, please share that as well. Thanks. <laughs>